immediate rate for our worship service. I do want to remind those of you who missed it this morning, we did resume Sunday school this morning. So if you didn't make it out and you want to come join us, it's a lot of fun. We are doing something a little different this year, which is uh, for starting this season off, which is a united team. So what's being taught downstairs is being taught upstairs, and it's, it's a great time, a lot of fun, really enjoyed it. Um, for those of you who we're not here, though. I do strongly recommend you join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. I know that's early. Some of us have come to enjoy the extra sleep. Uh, however, with that said, I think we get a lot out of it. As we get ready to do our worship service this morning, but I do have a couple other announcements I'm going to go through real quick. Number one, back in the back, the red box that uh, totes in on the quarters for Show Me. The Show Me Christian items that are needed are listed in the bulletin. But they continue to be canned fruits, vegetables, paper supplies, clean supplies, all that stuff. Bradley, is there anything else to show me in desperate need of right now? Mainly just a lot of light canned fruits and vegetables. Okay, a lot of light canned fruits and vegetables. Uh, so let's see if we can fill that up again this month. And then also, uh, Bible study is set to resume this Wednesday. We're still working on the location because, well, there's been a lot of chaos since the last time we met. What was that? Mean? I think it's in our house. Oh, there it is at our house. Problem solved. Uh, so, thank you, dear. <laughs> Alright, is there any other announcements that need to be made? Alright. If not, it is the first Sunday of the month, August 1st. So, is there anybody with a word. birthday or anniversary in the month of August? <clears throat> And she gets to live regret it driving for me. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, if you have a birthday or anniversary in the uh, month of August, go ahead and come forward. Wow. August? Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> wow. 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 All right, cool. All right, so we got a couple anniversaries, a couple of birthdays, so we'll do the birthday blessing first and then have a prayer for the couples. All right, ready? May after your return on the day of your birth, may sunshine and gladness be given, and may the dear Father prepare you on earth for a more beautiful birthday in heaven. Go ahead and bow with me in the word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for these couples that are out here. We pray that you would bless them and continue to strengthen their marriages so they will grow stronger to you and stronger to each other, that they will grow closer and that relationship will continue to blossom and flourish. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. And I've got a can here for where we've got stuff going. I have to confess, my daughter didn't. Okay. <laughs> you didn't know you were going to be my martyr, so that's going to be fine for Father, 
We ask you to open our hearts, that you touch our lives, that you transform us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Encourage us through your word. Sharpen us. Strengthen us. Bring into our lives an all-consuming passion for your word and for your presence. In Jesus' holy and precious name. Good morning. Now, apparently this morning I was playing Stump the Pianist. I picked out a song that, or a chorus that I know by heart um, and <coughs> Stump the Pianist a little. I hope that everyone knows it. It's him, or chorus, excuse me, 557 in your book, More Precious Than Silver. We'll sing it through twice. I don't think we have that many. Uh, hymn number 96, Great is Thy Faithfulness. This one will be quite familiar, or should be, to everyone. All three verses. We're singing in class. Okay.
communion, we're going to turn to hymn number 433. I surrender all. We'll sing all the verses and stand together on the third verse. <coughs> Saturday night came and your mom sent you to go take a bath and she told you remember that cleanliness is next to godliness and you said where does it say that she says well it's in the Bible somewhere and it's interesting to see how many things that people think are in the Bible and how many things that are in the Bible that people don't know that are there and there's, there's another idiom. Anybody know what an idiom is? Not idiot, an idiom. It's a, any English majors in here? No. But an idiom is a phrase, a metaphorical phrase, that has a meaning different than the literal words. And sometimes that idiom that string of words takes on a, a, a separate, a different meaning. Now, if I was to start one, can you finish it? You can lead a horse to water, which can't, can't make him drink. Okay? And did you know that's in the Bible? Not in so many words, but that thought, that phrase, that concept, is, uh, is in Luke. And some of you probably remember this as a little different story, but uh, it starts in uh, Luke chapter 18, verse 18. It says, A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. 
you know the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. All of these I have done since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. But when he heard this, he was very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard this said, Who then can be saved? And Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. Well, where does the leading the horse to water come in? If you think about it, everything in that young man's life, all the prophets, everything that had been written, everything, all the laws of Moses, was pointing him to this man, pointing him to the living water. And when he got there, he wouldn't drink. Because what is possible with God, oftentimes, mankind ignores. So as we come around the communion table this morning, we're reminded that God has provided for us. God has provided the living water for us. And all we have to do is drink. We bow to this. Heavenly Father, again, we take this time to acknowledge the love that you poured out for us, to acknowledge, to recognize the plan of salvation, to recognize the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. And as we take the cup that represents the blood offering and we take the bread that represents the bodily sacrifice of your one and only Son, help us to realize that everything that we have, everything that we need is provided by you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
funeral was Friday and thanks to the ladies of the church that helped out with uh, food for the family and so we want to keep uh, family of George and Lucy and her mom in uh, in our prayers also um, as far as uh, you know keep Karen Kohler from um, show me her health in the prayers also uh, Diane Maddox uh, who helps read us the friend to read us and helps that show me a lot is uh, has pancreatic cancer uh, a neighbor of ours down the road um, Tina Young uh, is uh, in the hospital with COVID and she's pretty sick so we um, she told us that she would appreciate prayers from the church for her her name's Tina yes uh, Tim uh our aunt uh, Jerry did pass away Friday. Service will be Tuesday. Okay. Let's see. Is that? That's a D, where it says DG's aunt. Okay, DG's aunt. Okay. So uh, prayers for the family there. Are there any other updates or our new requests? Um, yes. My neighbor has COVID. So far, it, but she's okay, so Amy's niece, Amber. One of the little ones in Knox's daycare class, which would be wonderful just to pass people going. So, Knox's whole group is going to be Okay, and that's your. Name. Grandson. Yeah. Grandson. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, okay. Sherry's grandson, the class. With this daycare, the fact COVID's rearing its head again, so we need to be careful and, and um, try to be safe there. Uh, and yet, yes. Speaking of COVID, I got a text from David Housemaster last night. Um, he asked the church to pray for his daughter to land, and she has a positive COVID test. Well, and who's that? David Housemaster. That's the gentleman that uh, pops in occasionally and okay. drops off an offering. Um, Praise that uh, Craig uh, is doing better. He was in the hospital earlier, which uh, wasn't COVID, but it was, uh, it was pneumonia. pneumonia. So praise that he's doing better, and just pray he keeps doing well. Any other updates or requests? Um, if not. I wanted to uh, read from uh, the book of Ephesians chapter 3, and the thought uh, before we pray is um, two words, access and power. Sometimes acts, the right access gives us power to get things done or do things that we couldn't do on our own, right? Uh, how many of us here could just ring up the White House and talk to this? Joe Biden if we wanted to. Probably not very many of us, right? Or how many of us could um, could call up uh, Bill Gates or, you know, be over the guy that owns Amazon? Not very many of us, right? Uh, my wife's favorite Christian singer is Michael W. Smith, and he told a story once when I, we were at a concert. And he happened to be friends with, uh, I think, the first... George Bush that was president. He was he was had you know became friends with him and he told a story once of how he was going on a trip overseas and it was a mission trip and um, he got to the airport and his passport was all messed up and they weren't going to let him go you know because it was messed up Some, somehow uh, there was a something wrong and the plane was getting you know he was going to miss the flight, to, and he was going. And it, they said to straighten this out is going to take weeks. So you know the whole trip was just in shambles. And he called his friend George, and it all got took care of like that. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So sometimes having access to the right people, um, and he made the plane. I mean, it's like within hours, boom. Okay, go on through. So sometimes having access to the right people gives us power that we don't have on our own. So I want to read this scripture in Ephesians chapter 3. It says here, 
talking about his intent. It's talking about God. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 12, In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my suffering for you, which are your glory. Paul is in prison. If you read the first verse of chapter 3, he says, I'm a prisoner of Christ. And he says, but guess what? We have, through Jesus Christ, if we're Christians, he says, we can approach God with freedom and confidence. That's better than the president. That's better than the richest men and women on earth. As Christians, we can approach God. And so then I'm going to read verse 14. He says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of God's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So when we think about this, when we, you know, we have prayer requests, we have concerns for us, others, something to remember we have access to the creator of the universe through our relationship with Jesus Christ. We can pray in Jesus' name and know that God hears us. Now we know from the rest of the scriptures that God doesn't say yes to everything that we ask. But we can know that he hears us and we can know that he cares about us and we can know that he has a plan and we can have that power in our life to have a peace to know that God really loves us. And to me, that gives me peace and it gives me strength. He loved us enough if I just shared that he could send his son to die on the cross so that we could be saved. So let's pray. Father, we lift up those that we have mentioned. We lift up those that are on our hearts that have been unspoken, the requests and the concerns. But God, we are thankful that we can come to you in the name of Jesus because of what he did and our relationship with him that we can talk to you and that you hear us and we pray that we will have that power that we can grasp the love how deep and how wide and how long is that love that you have for us and that we can rest our lives our problems our successes we can everything in life we can rest it on you because we trust you and we trust you because we know that you love us. And we know that you love us because of what you have done. And in your name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and grab your Bible and turn over to John chapter 7. I'll join you there shortly. This morning, as we work through the seventh chapter of the Gospel of John, we we're going to be focusing primarily on verses 10 through 24. However, I think it's important that we set some groundwork to help us out in our study this morning. I don't know um, if you are familiar, but we live in a world that doesn't believe in truth. We live in a world that does not believe that there are certain things that cannot be changed. And I don't know about you, but my life growing up has shown me that there are certain things that are true. There are certain things that do not change. Primary of which is who God is and what he has done for us. But our lives are full of different memories 
different turning points, different stories. Some of us, if it would not have been for certain people, would not be where we are now. Some of us would not have received the gospel message or heard the truth of Jesus Christ if somebody had not taken the time to be interested in our lives. But we also have that same aspect of being able to influence other people by presenting them with the truth of Jesus Christ. And it's in those moments that oftentimes we are met with some resistance, aren't we? There are some people that are downright hostile to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can remember that when I was attending Edwardsburg High School as I was growing up, I worked for a little grocery store called Harding's Friendly Market, which probably none of you have ever heard of except for Emily. And so Harding's Friendly Market was kind of, well, I don't know, it's kind of like Piggly Wiggly. Let's go with Piggly Wiggly. And so it's that kind of grocery store. It's a small little chain that was at that time still family owned, but they had some franchisees that bought in. And I worked there during my senior year as part of a co-op program. And I remember that I often had the pleasure, I use that term sarcastically, of working with a particular manager by the name of Larry. He was a gruff, middle-aged man who had a pretty good temper. Looking back, I believe that he honestly took sick pleasure in making the lives of certain employees miserable, making them suffer. And his targets were often a friend of mine named Greg, a young lady named Heather, and myself. We all three had something in common. Greg was the son of a local pastor. Heather was the daughter of a well-known Christian mechanic by the name of Mike. And you can figure out where I fit into that category. We all three were Christians. We were faithful, or at least we tried to be, and we attended church regularly. Larry hated our guts because of what we stood for. But to be fair, Larry had been going through some difficult times in his life, especially in his marriage. And so one day, I remember that as Greg and I were working on some projects in the store, he comes stomping up with this pure expression of distaste on his face. Greg and I looked at each other and we go, oh, here we go. We knew we were in for it. But I'll never forget the conversation that followed. In his angry, gruff voice, he says, tell me with all of your wisdom and all of your faith how you would save your marriage. And Greg and I just kind of looked at each other because Greg's 20 and I'm 18. Neither one of us are married. Greg had a girlfriend. We're like, uh... You ever had that moment where you're just completely dumbfounded and don't know what to say? I have to admit, though, I was thankful that Greg was there because Greg, being the son of a pastor, he was very well versed in Scripture. And so after a few moments of silence, we, uh, we turned to each other, we talked a little bit, and we just start to try to, to the best of our ability, deliver the word of life and truth found in God's holy word. Were we eloquent? By no means. Were we graceful? No. Did we try? Yes. We hoped that that's all Larry would need. That he would just need somebody to point him to Jesus Christ, to help him develop a relationship. But the words that he spoke still stick with me. Jesus, huh? So is Jesus the Son of God? Lord and Savior? Is Jesus really the answer? Now you're all going, yeah, huh? The next part, though, I'll never forget. I don't think so. And even if he were, I don't care. I want to live my life the way I want. Many of you have probably heard those words. Perhaps maybe you've even witnessed to someone and that has been their response. They didn't know and they didn't care what you had to say. They rejected it. But we see this time and time again, don't we? As we look in our world, we see people that are confronted with the truth of the gospel message and they just don't care. But I think the sad truth is that this often happens within the church. That people in the church who are living in sin, when they're confronted with the truth, when they're confronted with God's holy word, when they're faced with rebuke and correction, they respond with, I don't care. Have you ever heard that phrase? 
Maybe your children have used that phrase on you. In this morning's passage, Jesus is going to go to the Festival of Tabernacles, or booths, depending on how your Bible translates it. And he's going to call out the religious leaders for their failure to put into practice what they've studied. Remember, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, were very well versed in Scripture. They knew the Old Testament. They knew the law of Moses. But often, as Jesus points out, they did not practice what they preached. And in fact, Jesus is going to say to the religious leaders, the title of today's message, you just don't get it. Join with me in John chapter 7, starting at verse 1. We do have to do a little bit of entry ground point here to kind of understand what's going on because there's honestly a point of contention here that some people try to use to discredit the entire Gospel of John as well as Scripture as a whole. John chapter 7, starting at verse 1. After this, Jesus traveled in Galilee since he did not want to travel in Judea because the Jews were trying to kill him. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty good reason not to go somewhere, isn't it? The Jewish festival of shelters, or tabernacles, or booths, was near. So his brothers, referring to his half-brothers from Joseph and Mary, said to him, Leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples can see your works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he is seeking public recognition. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Now notice in verse 5, For not even his brothers believed in him. You ever had a sibling like that? Or something that you enjoy doing, or something that you're doing to benefit other people, and they think that you're doing it for your own recognition to be selfish, prideful, and arrogant, and so they kind of they poke you, it's like poking a bear with a stick, or trying to get a reaction out of you. Notice how Jesus responds. Jesus told them, "My time has not yet arrived, but your time is always at hand. The world cannot hate you because it because it, the world cannot hate you, but it does hate me because I testify about it that its works are evil." Go up to the festival yourselves. I'm not going up to this festival because my time has not yet fully come. After he had said these things, he stayed in Galilee. After his brothers had gone up to the festival, they all, then he also went up, but not openly, but secretly. The Jews were looking for him at the festival, saying, Where is he? And there was a lot of murmuring about him among the crowds. Some were saying, He's a good man. Others were saying, No, on the contrary, he's deceiving the people. Still, nobody was talking publicly about him for fear of the Jews. When the festival was already half over, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. John gives us this account by making it mention of this bizarre altercation between Jesus and his brothers. Jesus had not yet gone to Judea for the festival of the tabernacles because the religious leaders were trying to kill him. Again, it's a good reason not to go to Judea, don't you think? But what's interesting, the text makes it very clear in verse 5, that Jesus' half brothers did not believe, but still wanted him to go to Judea. They wanted him to go and work all these miracles and reveal himself, not because they thought he was the Son of God, but because they thought it would be a great show. Don't you love family like that? And Jesus responds with, it is not my time. Now, I don't know about you, but this opens a can of worms, because what happens? What does Jesus end up doing? He ends up going anyway, doesn't he? And some people want to go, well, you see, Jesus went ahead and went to the festival of booths, but he said he wasn't going, but he did go. So he's either A, a liar, or B, he changed his mind. But if he's God, he can't change his mind, so therefore he can't be God. Don't you love when people do this nonsense? Well, what's really going on here? What is really going on here? Well, it's interesting because the Greek language doesn't mean this. it's just not my time. It means more accurately, my time is not fully yet. So if I tell you we're supposed to be somewhere at 8 o'clock, what time do you show up? Some of you 8.15. <laughs> Some of you 7.45. But just because you're there, does that mean the event's starting at 7.45 or does it start at 8? It starts at 8. The time is not fully complete. And we have to understand this. Jesus' brothers are trying to aid him on to get him to go according to their timetable, not God's. Jesus' ministry is bound by God's strict timetable, not ours. And so Jesus isn't lying. 
Jesus isn't changing his mind. When he says, it is not my time, he's literally saying, it's not time for me to go yet. And so he kicks back and he relaxes in Galilee. And then he goes up to the festival. But not publicly. Quietly. Because the time, the hour of his sacrifice was not yet. And then about halfway through the festival, he goes in the temple. And you all know what happens when Jesus goes into the temple. The conflict, the chaos begins. Because he's going to confront the religious leaders on their hypocrisy. He's going to point out that for those who should be well educated, they have no idea what's going on. So what's about to take place is perhaps a very good application for the church. Join with me in verse 14. John chapter 7, starting at verse 14. When the festival was already half over, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews were amazed and said, How is this man so learned, since he hasn't been trained? Jesus answered them, My teaching isn't mine, but is from the one who sent me. If anyone wants to do his will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking of my own accord. The one who speaks on his own seeks his own glory, but he who speaks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Didn't Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keeps the law? Ouch. Why are you trying to kill me? You have a demon, the crowd responded. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus responded, I performed one work, and you were all amazed. This is why Moses has given you circumcision. Not that it comes from Moses, but from the fathers. And, you're circumc- and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so the law of Moses won't be broken, why are you angry at me because I made a man entirely well on the Sabbath? Stop judging according to outward appearances. Rather, judge according to righteous judgment. Notice what he says in verse 16. My teaching isn't mine, but it's from the one who sent me. The question that is posed there is, where does Jesus' authority, where does his teaching come from? The answer is simple. Jesus received his wisdom directly from his Father in heaven. His insight was divine, surpassing anything which man could obtain. This answer, I'm sure, fueled their hatred, don't you think so? Because Jesus is claiming to be someone special. He's claiming to be somebody important. But now as he's making that claim, he's demonstrating it. But this time, not by miracles, by the very words that he's uttering. And the Jewish leaders are furious. I think it's important for us to understand that as a church, when we convey the truth of Scripture, we are not teaching precepts of men, We are not teaching our personal opinions. We are sharing the very life-giving words of God. Your authority and my authority to communicate God's truth does not come from who we are. It's not because I'm Pastor Rob. It's not because he's Elder Tim Berry. It's not because of who we are. It is because this is God's inspired, holy, inerrant, infallible, authoritative word. This is where our authority comes from. We must convey the truth of God's word, not our opinions. This is a very important point. We preach, we teach, and we live the scripture. Not our personal opinions. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through chapter 4, verse 3 says that all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Did you catch that? So that we can be complete, equipped for every good work. I think a lot of times the reason why we struggle to produce good fruit is because we struggle to be grounded in Scripture. But notice Paul goes on to say to Timothy, the young preacher, I solemnly charge you before Christ, before God and Christ Jesus who's going to judge the living and the dead, and because of his appearing and his kingdom, 
Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. For the time will come, I tell you it is here, when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. Does that sound familiar? But here's the issue. We stand on the authority of Scripture. We speak from the authority of Scripture. But we have a message that we must take. And if we're honest, church, we're being drowned out by a bunch of heretical false teaching. We're being drowned out by these social justice and equality movements because we're whispering. But notice what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verses, chapter 10, verses 8 through 17. On the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. The message of faith that we proclaim, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, we're not getting into baptism and all that stuff. I, we can all agree on where we stand as a church on that. How then can they call on him that they have not believed in, and how can they believe without hearing from him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? Are you noticing a pattern here? What does he say? For as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. We have the message of life, and we have to take it, and we have to relay it. But it's not based on our authority. It is based on the authority that comes from above through the holy word of God. And yet we walk around sugarcoating everything. Trying to drown it out. Have you ever had... Well, yeah, I'm going to use this illustration. When Emily and I got married, we had this beautiful wedding cake. And we had this beautiful punch. Now, I'm going to get this out there right there. The recipe belonged to her grandmother, correct? Yeah, I don't know where I got it from. Okay. But it was a recipe that she really loved. Let's we'll just go with that. Okay. So this is our wedding day. By the way, not a good way to, to uh, help your wedding day here. I had a cold, though. Some of you may already see where this is going. I had a cough drop in my mouth. And so I took a drink of this punch and went, oh, caught on camera in front of my wife. Okay. And I did say, it doesn't taste so good with a cough drop. But sometimes when you have two flavors that hit each other, they don't mix very well, do they? How many of you like spicy stuff? A couple of you? Okay. Anybody here ever tried Carolina Reaper? Trinidad Scorpion Pepper? Some hot stuff. So hot, in fact, that you could easily down a gallon of milk trying to put out the fire. There are some things that just don't go well together. And the reality is, as we preach the truth of the gospel message, there's going to be pushback. In fact, the Apostle Paul goes on to say in verse 16 of chapter 10 of Romans, but not all obeyed the, obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So there are some people that when you preach the truth, you're standing on the authority of Scripture, they're going to tell you, for no lack of better words, shut off. Because they don't want to hear it. But according to the Apostle Paul, faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes from the message about Christ. So as you are evangelizing and ministering, what authority are you standing on? Unlike the Christ, unlike Christ and the apostles, guess what? We don't have the miraculous signs to validate our message, do we? So how is it our message is validated? Notice what Jesus says in verse 17. If anyone wants to do his will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking independently. My little paraphrase there. It's an astonishing idea, isn't it? 
I don't want us to miss that point. The fruit of our life credentials the message in which we speak. If we are no different than the world, then we nullify our message. Now, praise be to God that He is faithful even when we are not. But if you have that person that you've been trying to evangelize to, you've been trying to witness, maybe for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, if your life doesn't reflect what you're preaching, it is going to fall on deaf ears. But I think there's another important aspect of this. When you hear the word presented on Sunday morning, you need to be studying and looking for yourself to verify that what is said is true. One of the greatest commending things said in Scripture that takes place in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, where Luke records that the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because they listened to what Paul said, they received the message with eagerness, but then you know what they did? They went home and they did their homework. Every single day, as Paul preached when they went home, they were going through the Scripture, looking to see if what Paul said was true. How about us? When you hear that radio preacher, are you checking things against Scripture to see that they're true? When you hear that communion meditation on Sunday morning, are you checking the Scripture to make sure that it's true? When you hear the message preached on Sunday morning, are you going home and looking to see if it's true? The elders have a very important job to defend the flock. But guess what? You have an important job to work alongside the Holy Spirit to protect your own heart. This may be a sore subject, but it cannot be escaped. If we are to know the will of God, to be able to credential the message, to be able to verify that what we we hear is true, if we're going to be able to distinguish between false and inspired teaching, we must daily be in God's word. Consider what the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you, I plead with you, I implore you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, because this is your true, proper, expected worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. How are you going to know what the will of God is if you're not in His Word? How am I going to know what you need as a congregation if I'm not praying and in God's Word? How are we going to know what to teach the children if we are not in God's Word? How are we going to know how to come back the heresies and false teachings of this age if we are not rooted in God's Word. There are no problems, no shortage of problems facing the church. But I want to give you a couple of them that terrify me. Biblical illiteracy. Biblical apathy. Destructive forces. People that don't read their Bible and people that don't care that they don't read their Bible. It's a problem. How are you going to know? How are you going to defend? How are you going to stand strong? Honestly, we shouldn't be surprised that our culture is affecting the church so much. When many in the church, and even in the pulpit, are incapable of defending the faith. It should be no surprise that a lot of churches have accepted whatever the acronym is today, because it changes every day shouldn't be a surprise that churches have renounced the deity of Jesus Christ. It shouldn't be a surprise that churches go, eh, we don't need that. Let's just have a good talk today. I want to encourage you today. I do want to encourage you. I do want you to know that you're loved. But what I say is irrelevant. This is what matters. If it's not based on this, It's just a nice talk. It's not truth. Justification for that is love, by the way. The love without correction is not love at all. If you love your child and tell them, 
not to touch something hot, you've done good, right? But which one of you who love your child will not tell them to avoid touching something that's hot? If you have a child that makes a mistake that gets them injured, are you not going to coach them so that they don't do the same thing again? How many of you would say, I love you, sweetie, go play in the street. Not a single one of you. But we say, I love you, Jesus loves you. And then promote the sin. We cannot pick and choose which parts of God's word we wish to obey. Certain aspects of the Mosaic law, true, are no longer enforced regarding the ceremonial, national, and hygienic purity. But there are truths of Scripture that apply today. There are still things that are immoral, that are against God's statutes. And yes, we are commanded to love people. But true love means that you do not allow them to stay in their current situation. If we are not motivated to change our lives, and do not motivate others to change their lives... We are not speaking or hearing the truth. Notice what Jesus says in verse 18. He tells the religious leaders, didn't God, didn't Moses give you the law? And yet you don't keep it. There's two, there's two faces on this coin. One, the people who are biblically illiterate and biblically apathetic. And then there are the people that are so knowledgeable of Scripture, they could quote to you Psalm 119 front to back in ancient Hebrew. But it never gets from here to hear. And if it's locked up up here, it's not going to do you a whole lot of good. I think that's another danger facing the church. And that danger leads into legalism. And legalism is a very big danger. Point number three and the final point. He tells him in verse 24, stop judging on outward appearances. Stop judging based upon the law. Stop judging based upon your traditions and your precepts. Because notice what he says. He says, you're angry at me because I healed somebody on the Sabbath, but yet you're okay if they have to go and travel to be circumcised on the eighth day and it falls on a Sabbath. You're perfectly fine with that. If they have to travel all the way to the temple, you're, you're cool with that. But this poor guy over here that has not been able to walk for 40 years that I healed so that he can get up and go get food and get a job and provide for his family. You're upset about that. I would akin that to being upset that somebody spilled something on the carpet versus us not having church in this building, but rather having it in the park so the whole community can join us. It doesn't make sense, does it? The things that we put value on sometimes are just absurd. And Jesus tells the religious leaders, you're trying to hold people to all these traditions and, and man-made rules, but you can't even obey the law of Moses. By the way, do you know how many traditions and regulations they added to the law of Moses? In the Mosaic Law, there are 613 individual commands. The Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes added an additional six, over 600, like 630, 600, something like that. How many of you can obey 1,200 rules? The answer to that is no one, because we can't even remember two, love God and love your neighbor. And that's what the Pharisees did. They made it impossible. They made it difficult, and yet they held everybody to those standards, but they themselves ignored them. And so there are churches and there are groups that have developed manuals and confessions and creeds and catechisms to assist in their, their discipleship efforts. And don't misunderstand me. I don't think there's anything wrong with those. I think they're very helpful. But there's a problem. And that problem is when those become the standard of judgment instead of God's Word. When those become the standard of preaching and teaching instead of God's Word. There are some people that have those things. They can quote to you, hey, well, the manual says this on page 347, line 5, verse, you know, whatever. But they can't even quote the reference to the Bible verse that backs up that teaching. That's a problem. 
our authority is based on God's word. So how do we get it? How do we not be like the Pharisees and the Sadducees? First, we must understand that our authority does not come from ourselves, it comes from God. Secondly, we must do the will of our Father in Heaven to show the validity of our message and to verify what we are hearing is true. Finally, we must use the Word of God as our standard of judgment and practice. Yes, some of you may know of the Westminster Confession. Some of you may know of the Heidelberg Confession. You may like to read those. Some of you may know the Apostles' Creed. But those do not supersede the authority of God's Word. And I think that's the problem. I think in too many houses, in too many churches, this book is ignored, rejected, and sits on a shelf, not used. Let me close with this passage of Scripture as the, as the song leader comes forward. 2 Timothy. I'll do it. I'm going back there. But not chapter 3. Chapter 2. Notice what he says to be an improved worker. Yes, I understand he's talking to Timothy, but I think this principle applies to the church as a whole. Remind him of these things and charge them before God, not to fight about words. This is useless and leads to the ruin of those who listen. Be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth, a whole way of reverent and angry speech. Those who engage in it will produce even more godlessness, and their teaching will spread like gangrene. What an image. But let's be honest. Isn't that what we see? We see all these, these trendy Christian, I use that term in our quotations, teaching. Remember when I talked about several weeks ago, the ex evangelicals? This idea that there's a, a, a universal Christ, a universal salvation. You can be a Buddhist and go to heaven. You can be uh, a Hindu and go to heaven because there's a universal Christ. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe something. That's becoming predominant in mainline churches along with everything else. And I think we know the reason why, don't we? I don't misunderstand. This is not to be conveyed up. This is a call to be in God's Word experience the truth, the hope, and the revelation that is found in this book. One of my favorite scenes in, in the Chronicles of Narnia is as Edna and Lucy are getting ready to leave. Lucy asks the question, will we ever see you again? And as I'm the songs with, which is like, Christ for the C.S. Lewis books that yes, you will. But you must find me in your world because in your world I go by a different name. And so there are people looking. And we have that word. We have that truth. And they desperately need it. Will you stand as we pray? Grace is something, Father. Lord, we ask that you would be with us and guide us, help us to serve you, to do your will. Lord, help us to be diligent in our study, to be prepared. Well, yes, being a Christian is more than just being able to quote a Bible passage. It is an active relationship with your Son, Jesus Christ, as who we submit to as Lord, and who we embrace as Savior. Oh Lord, your word is a beautiful love letter that has been given to us to guide us, to teach us, to help us grow. The Holy Spirit uses it to bring in true transformation. The Lord, so many churches have forgotten. They've left it. And because of that, they have no standard of judgment. They have no standard of truth. They have nothing to go off of. Father, we beseech you for revival in this nation. But for that to take place, it must start in our hearts. And we hunger and thirst for your word as we seek your Son, Jesus Christ, in your name we pray. Amen.